Welcome to the Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. Our guest today is John Mark Nadeau, CEO of the Saskatchewan Urban Municipality Association. Now, at the turn of the century, the local city, town, and village governments of Saskatchewan believed it was necessary to have an organization though, through which they could, on a collective basis, express their needs and desires for legislative and financial services to the provincial government. Now, in 1906, the Union of Saskatchewan Municipalities, the name would later change to SUMA, held their first convention. Since then, SUMA has been the collective voice for Saskatchewan municipalities representing the interest of municipal governments on policy and programs matters within the provincial jurisdiction. John Mark Nadeau has been the CEO of SUMA since 2017, previously serving as the city of manager for the city of Portage la Prairie, Manitoba. He has also worked in various roles in the RCMP in Ottawa, Manitoba, Northern BC, the Northwest Territories, and Nunavut. He also served overseas as a senior rule of law advisor in Afghanistan with NATO. With that, John Mark, welcome to the Political Trenches. Well, thank you very much, Chris, and good afternoon, Ian. Good to see you guys. It's good to see you, John. So to kick off the interview, a uh, simple question for you here. What do you believe is the state of municipalities in Saskatchewan today? Well, Chris, uh, municipalities are um, all in all quite a well position. Um, I mean, they have to provide balanced budgets, so... Uh, in the short term, they are viable and they're doing really well, thriving. I think there's some uh, challenges with uh, some of the economic development uh, initiatives that are, um, you know, the broadband's an issue, for example. Coming out of uh, of the COVID uh, pandemic, we saw that um, people can work from home. And um, so that is a good omen for some of those smaller communities to attract and retain uh employees i for example one of my colleague works uh not in regina and and has access to broadband and it's and it's fine it's when you get into the smaller uh units uh in the province that we're gonna see some challenges and uh one of the challenge one of the work that we're doing with suma is around broadband and, and hopefully that's going to uh lead to uh significantly better broadband across the province so the <laughs> To better understand the collective voice of who SUMA is, what is considered a urban municipality in the province of Saskatchewan? And I, I hate to ask that simple question, but I think it's an important one before we get into this uh, entire interview. It's a huge question, Chris. In fact, we're launching a We Are Urban campaign here uh, in connection with our elections campaign for this fall, provincial election in October. Um, huge challenges for our municipality. Uh, the provincial, the federal government, sorry, recognizes urban, any community over 100,000 in population. Well, if that were the case in Saskatchewan, you'd have two urban municipalities. There's actually 400, nearly 450 urban municipalities in Saskatchewan. So if I could put it in very simple term, every time there's a few, you know, more than a couple houses located together, because we do have villages with 20 people in them uh, that are urban. But every time there's a um, location with more than just a few houses and there's a water treatment plant or uh, and or a uh, water uh, or sewer treatment plant, that's an urban municipality. So we have um, 246 villages and resort villages, 147 towns, that have a population of 500 to uh, 4,999. And we have 16 cities uh, ranging from uh, the smallest, about 5,000 in uh, Melville, all the way to Saskatoon with 260,000 people. So we cover about 80% of the population when it comes to our membership. And, um, you know, and some of our crown corporations recognize only nine cities as urban. So we're we, you know, we're facing a big challenge in trying to make sure that people recognize that urban uh, under the act. And I should say that it's under the municipal act. So it's it's not like we're making stuff up. It's it's legislated that urban municipalities are about 100, 450 uh, urban municipalities in the province. Wow. 
you made a reference, as you remember, to the election that's coming up this fall, and you, you made a comment about broadband, for example. What sort of uh, issues do you think are starting to bubble up, if any, in terms of local election issues around the province? If there's anything that is consistent? Well, I think uh, our one of our cornerstone uh, advocacy file is mental health and addiction, and and we applauded uh, several times the province with uh, some of their investments around expansion of uh, treatment beds and and so on. But um, at the end of the day, the what remains to be dealt with is the entire uh, uh, service and support to those that have mental health and addiction issues. Uh, it's fine to provide them a bed. Um, and, and as Chris mentioned in the opening, my background being in policing, uh, I've seen it throughout my career. Um, you bring somebody for some addiction treatment and 28 days is not enough. We know that. Um, and what happens when they're uh, back on the street, they go back to their old habits, right? The definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over and expect different results. Mm -hmm. So um, the issues that we are going to be advocating during the uh, provincial elections coming up is further investments by the province to help um, deal with the mental health and addiction issues in the province. And it doesn't affect just the, the larger urbans. We see it, homelessness in Regina encampments that we dealt with now two summers in a row. Um, we're seeing it in smaller urbans as well, the Nakims of the world and the, you know, and, I, and I'm just picking a name. I'm, I'm not suggesting that there's necessarily an issue in Nakim, but those smaller urbans are also seeing mental health and addiction issues, couch surfing, um, people using the public uh, washrooms at the rink to uh, wash themselves because they have nowhere else to go. Um, and, and we're seeing that. So um we need to as a as a province we need to see more investments in support for mental health and addictions not just 28 day um treatment beds that they've announced which is awesome um and also with respect to public housing there's a large number of vacant um public housing in Saskatchewan and uh we need to find ways to uh allow the rules to change so that people can uh, use those. Um, and, uh, and you know, those will be some of the higher topics that we're going to be advocating during the camping. Okay. You, I, we watched the BC elections, I guess it would be last year, maybe even the year before. And they had, I remember them saying they had something like 40% turnover in their local elected officials, mayors and councillors and whatnot. How do you attract people? And so Saskatchewan is going to face people who are choosing not to rerun uh, for their local councils this fall, potentially. How do you attract people to be part of local governments in Saskatchewan to run for those elected offices? Yeah, those are that's a good question be, because in Saskatchewan, they notoriously have a low turnover. Um, and in fact, we have a low uh, participation rate in the elections. Um, I think, um, you know, I think we need to address some of the issues around social media. Um, a lot of, uh, I know a lot of people that I've spoken with uh, suggesting, hey, you should run for your local council sort of thing. They said, wow, I can't be bothered with all the trolls and, and uh, the bullying that's happening on social media and whatnot. So there needs to be some education around that. Um, I, you know, I don't have the magic bullet. I think it's just an effort that uh, all of us need to recognize that uh, hiding behind the keyboard or the screen and 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 typing out an email or or uh, I was subject to that in Man in Manitoba. Uh, somebody had written um, a two page uh, missive about what apparently I had done wrong in my terms in uh, as city manager and had distributed it to the entire community, forty five hundred houses. Um, that's insane, um, and that happens more often than not. We at SUMA do a lot with um, education and uh, training for our elected officials and to an extent our um, uh, administrators um, in partnership with UMass, not to uh, take over by what they're doing, of course. But um, and so, you know, uh, ensuring that there's good governance 
uh, is important and and show to the public that there's good governance so that people, you know, hopefully interested in the future in, in running for, for public office. But the bullying right now is just insane and it needs to be dealt with somehow. Before Chris takes over, you mentioned UMass. Can you tell us what UMass is? UMass is the um, Urban Municipalities Administrators Association of Saskatchewan. So um, we work quite closely with UMass. In fact, their president is uh, an ex officio on our board of directors. So uh, we're quite linked to, to the association and uh, we do some work together um, whenever. Uh, in fact, uh, we launched last year a uh, training program. Uh, it's a two-year business uh, diploma from University the uh, SAS Polytechnic here in Saskatchewan. And um, the first year, all the students take the same course uh, load. The second year, they specialize. There's eight different specialization, and one of them is municipal administration. And that was a partnership with UMass that uh, that saw the light of this uh, this program, and we're quite excited about that. Kind of about, if you've listened to the show, you know I like to ask stupid questions, but I'm going to ask a stupid question because I think it's important. 450 hypothetically municipalities in the province of Saskatchewan. Can you name all of them? Can you literally say that you like you know people from every single? And I'm not trying to be rude about that. It's just that's a lot of diverse voices at the table. And I know your board of governors. I've met with uh, President Golden on numerous occasions. I've sat down with many of your board of directors on our show, the cross border interviews, and it seems like there's a lot of diverse voices at that table and diverse voices across the province, from all the way from Stony Rapids down to Macon, over to Maple Ridge to Yorkton. Across Across the gambit, how does Suma advocate for such a diverse population when it comes to 440, 450 voices trying to advocate for their own unique municipal needs? Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, one that I struggled with when I first started at Suma. If, if I were uh, to talk about what my thought pattern was six years ago, I would have told you that's insane. Having come out of Manitoba's forced amalgamation in 2013, I would have said in 2017 in Saskatchewan, 400 and what municipalities? That's crazy. However, I have visited 150 communities so far. Uh, COVID um, affected my ability to travel uh, and I'm hoping to resume that um, probably not this summer, but certainly the summer uh, next year. The fact that I was able to sit in those communities, even if it's just an hour and sit down with the mayor and council or, or the CAO or both and speak to them about their issues in their backyard, um, that was hugely informative for me as my sort of um, learning about the municipal, the municipal world in Saskatchewan. Having said that, and you, Chris, you know that because you were at our convention in April, we have just uh, had the membership approve a change of governance at SUMA, um, a governance that's been in place since 1905, uh, essentially, which was um, more or less of a regional representation with some sectoral, peppered with sectoral um, uh, discussions. We're moving to a caucus-based model where the towns will get together and discuss town-related issues, villages the same and the cities the same and and we feel that that is going to provide us with a much more focused approach to our advocacy and hearing out the different sector issues um, um and i'm quite frankly quite uh, excited about that uh looking forward to uh, our new governance being in place next year and uh and and we'll do a review in three years after that but uh i'm quite confident that that was that is going to give us a better ability to hear the concerns and not have the the village issue drowned out by the cities which um i can tell you that has never happened in my time uh i don't know about the past but there's this perception out there that villages issues get drowned out by the cities or vice versa um, and and that uh, I think will resolve that with the new caucus model. So 
while I was at Zuma, I sat down with some of the mayors and councillors from across the province and the overarching comments that I heard about the issues that are facing them. We talk about those diverse issues that each municipality is facing, but the one common issue that kept on coming up was infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. And I know you are not only part of SUMA, but you also work alongside FCM, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, in your role as CEO of SUMA. How does SUMA plan to address the ongoing needs that municipalities face when it comes to infrastructure funding? Because smaller communities can't build a $30 million wastewater treatment facility, even though they may need it. Yeah, um, listen, um, the Baldwin Act of 19, or 1849, sorry, 1849. Getting a history the, lesson here, getting a history lesson. Come on down. That was the, that was the start of the uh, property tax system. Fast forward, what, almost 180 years, um, we're still dealing with the same system. Uh, but now we're dealing with municipalities, dealing with road infrastructure, underground infrastructure, um, libraries, public safety, both on the police and the fire. Um, and they're still dealing with the same revenue stream as 1849. Um, yes, we're very fortunate in Saskatchewan. We have the municipal revenue sharing which in this year provided uh, to our municipal our, our municipalities $340 million that will be divided by uh, basically a per capita, on a per capita basis. But we're also going to be paying, and not to become political here, but we're also going to be paying the carbon tax. And we're also paying um, PST on um, labor for construction. Uh, which will, so, you know, we've argued that with the province and saying, well, you should, because we, we didn't used to pay PST on uh, construction, uh, labor uh, construction. Now we do. They say, well, you're getting it back on, on the revenue sharing. Well, actually, we're only getting 12.5% back uh, of any PST dollars on labor that we, uh, that we pay. So, so, no, we're not uh, being kept whole. And... Um, uh, so at the end of the day, we need to sit down with arguably the province, but I would say the feds need to be part of that conversation. And we need to talk about how do we sustain municip the municipalities. Um, property taxes um, is not uh, enough anymore. Uh, and, you know, there's only one taxpayer. So how are we going to do that? And... Um, we had invited a, a renowned uh, expert in uh, municipal financing at our convention, Dr. Eden Slack. And we're gonna continue having some conversation with, with uh, the good doctor because um, um, municipalities, as you said, are uh, managing 60% of the infrastructure in the, in the country, in the province as well, yet collect about nine or 10% of all the taxes. So there's a huge gap to be closed and um, we got to somehow close that gap uh, moving so, forward. Before I throw it over to Ian for a second, I should just mention this, that I, before I went to the SUMA convention, I was at the Association of Manitoba Municipalities Convention in Brandon, Manitoba. And I can tell you that revenue sharing that you, SUMA has, the Saskatchewan municipalities has with the province is an envy for a lot of provincial jurisdictions. So while you may have some challenges, a lot of municipalities are looking at you and wondering how can they get the same thing? Ian, over to you. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. And, and before I go to Ian, um, I was actually invited by the um, um, Union of Municipalities of New Brunswick um, it, just before our convention in April and provided uh, you know our experience with that because they're, they're also looking at that. I mean, Quebec is the only one, the only jurisdiction uh, other than Saskatchewan that has some kind of a model like that. Uh, you, you're absolutely right. We are the envy. But but having said that, there's still huge gaps to be closed. Yeah. I'll go with something structural as well. That um, Because we, this podcast or webcast or however you listen to it, it goes coast to coast and a bit more broadly than that. There are some things that are unique about how local government, well, local government structures and how things operate in local government in Saskatchewan. 
you want to point, can you point some of those out for people who may not be familiar with how things work in Saskatchewan? Um, well, we have, um, we have three municipal act, if you will, in Saskatchewan, um, the cities, 16 of them fall under one, uh, cities act. The, uh, the bulk of the municipalities, both the rural municipalities, as well as the, as the smaller urbans fall under what we call the municipal act of 2010. And then the Northern municipalities fall under, uh, uh their own Northern act. Um, by and large, all the municipal, all the acts are fairly similar. Um, although the cities have greater flexibility when it comes to property tax and assessment. Um, speaking of assessment, we have in Saskatchewan um, a uh, association that's responsible for providing uh, property assessment to most of the municipalities. The Saskatchewan Assessment Management Agency, uh, they provide assessment to most municipalities, the larger ones, Saskatoon, Regina, et cetera, have their own departments, but otherwise they rely on SAMA to provide the assessment. Um, that's different from um, some of the other jurisdictions. And again, go back to the number of municipalities. We have 1.2 million population in Saskatchewan, 775 municipalities. Um, go figure. It, you know, there's a, there's a lot of governance. Having said that, um, I went into this job with, again, oh my God, there's a lot of governance. But now that I have been here for, for uh, some time and have done a lot of, you know, quite a bit of research and, and literature review around amalgamation, what's good, what's bad, you know, um, bigger is not always better. And, and um, I think it needs to be um, you know, if there's going to be any rationalization of the sector, it's got to be done with the local, um, the local perspective in mind, not just a forced amalgamation like, uh, Manitoba in 2013. Right. Well, New Brunswick last year. Yeah, that's right. The, or, yep. or Quebec in Quebec in 2002 or Ontario in the late nineties, you know, I think, I think that the interesting approach to, uh, British Columbia was interesting under uh, Premier um, Campbell. He came at it because he was a, a city manager, or um, sorry, a city councillor in Vancouver. Came at it from a let's reinforce the act rather than try to dictate how the sector would be structured. So um, he took a different approach to it. Hmm. With so many municipalities, then I'll just kind of follow this and think about you. I suspect you have more municipalities per capita than any other province. How does that affect the viability of a lot of those probably very small municipalities? I have, uh, what well, I, I don't have. The province has uh, villages um, that have 20 people in them. So if you got a family of uh, five or six, boy, that affects your, uh, your, uh, your property uh, revenue, property tax revenue. Um, yeah, I mean, there's 4,400 elected officials in the province. Um, that's huge. Um, they're not going to make, you know, they don't retire on their on their salary, uh, mm -hmm. unlike the federal government when they retire after six years. Um, so they don't, you know, they're not in there to make money. Um, they're there to help their communities. And if there's a pothole, you don't call the premier of the province, you call the mayor of the town or the village. Um uh, so there's, you know, they're paid part time or for attending meetings here and there, but they're on call, you know, basically 24 seven. So, yeah, um, it's a huge commitment. But again, bigger is not always better. And I'm not sure that forcing any sort of amalgamation or or rationalizing the sector uh, wouldn't make a ton of sense because there's such a vast territory to cover and the towns and villages are not close by to you know the the borders are not contiguous so um you know yeah there's 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 some huge challenges with that so my final question for you then is you've been involved with suma for six or seven years if my math is right what are the biggest changes you've seen during your time there well internally we've uh we've done a lot of 
um, modernization of the organization. Um, uh, we've implemented um, a remote work policy following the, the, the pandemic. We've, we've implemented um, um, modified work weeks. So uh, following some more modern ways of, uh, of managing the workplace. Um, in the sector itself, I've, you know, I think our governance structure, our new governance structure is going to be helpful in hearing the membership's voice better and, and focus our efforts better. Um, and uh, I think uh, the sector itself, I mean, it, 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 it's continuing to operate, um, you know, fairly succinct way. Again, budgets need to be, but need to be balanced and, and, um, we have some issues, I think, on governance side in some of the municipalities. So we need to deal with the education and training of the new councillors. We're coming into a provincial, or sorry, a municipal election this fall in, in November. So next year, my colleagues and I will be busy with uh, helping uh, set up the, the, you know, some training and some mentoring. Um, so I think, I think there's some progress for sure. Um, I think the biggest issue for us, for the sector, and not just in Saskatchewan, is again um, revenue, making uh, the revenue stream more sustainable moving forward. At least, it, maybe at least having a review of what is it that a municipal body government should be responsible for? Is it responsible for social issues like we are we see in Ontario? and that we're starting to see in Saskatchewan. Is it responsible for public safety? Because really policing is a provincial jurisdiction. It's not a municipal one. So should we change that? Um, those are all very important questions that need to be uh, thought through. So I'm, I'm going to jump in for a few last questions here before we wrap up. And the first one is I want to harken back to an old story that Ian and I talked about in our last episode around Yukon. And um, Saskatchewan municipalities are becoming more innovative with the issues that they're dealing with. And there's one municipality in particularly, and I asked Ian last time if he could point to love on a map and he couldn't until after the story, but love Saskatchewan is kind of putting itself on its map on the map by becoming a tourist destination for lovers. Do you find that more and more Saskatchewan, smaller town Saskatchewan, smaller urban municipalities are becoming more innovative with the challenges that they face around that financial revenue stream that they aren't being able to access because they are dealing with an inundated, an outdated uh, program? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got, you know, you've got London, for example, with, um, innovation around um, uh, um, electricity um, generation. Um, they have a they have a um, uh, an interesting program going there. Um, you've got other municipalities with uh, more tourists. Uh, we were in Waka last year or two years ago and and saw um, and experienced their uh, their train and and and. Um, um, a distillery set up shop in Waka and boy, that was really good. Um, um, not whiskey, but, um, uh, anyway, very good liquor, um, vodka, sorry, that was the word. Um, so absolutely they need to diversify. I think we need to continue helping them, uh, along that line. And that's, uh, a strong partnership that, uh, Suma and, CEDA, the Saskatchewan Economic Development Alliance, um, work together. In fact, I'll be in Saskatoon on Wednesday to meet with my colleague at CEDA and, and see how, how we can uh, continue developing some programs in advance of the next election and, and post-election. Um, so absolutely, municipalities are becoming more and more um, cutting edge. Um, but again... Uh, is that enough? I don't think it is. And I go back to the conversation around sustainability of the revenue streams. Um, it's great. It's great that they're in innovative, but there's more that needs to be done. So my final question and our final question in this segment is um, 
Suma has a big year ahead of itself. You're rolling out the We Are Urban campaign. You have a provincial election on the horizon. You have a municipal election on the horizon. You also have your governance changes that you have to get in place before next April when you meet in Saskatoon for the 2025 convention. That seems like a tall order. Is Suma up for the task of trying to make sure that everything runs smoothly here? And I'm not trying to be rude here, but the question is just, it seems like it's a very tall order for an organization that represents so many diverse voices to undertake in a year's time. And it's our 120th anniversary next year. So we're preparing for that as well. Listen, we have a, uh, I have a, um, uh, a team, I work with a team that, that extremely effective and efficient um they are motivated uh we're all motivated to serving the members um we have our um our work is cut out for us but we're we've we we created um i call it a war room chris um it's probably not the right word in this context but that's my background so um but we've created a war room and we've got it all laid out the plan and how um, you know, things need to happen and when and and what are the topics and who are they going to be uh, assigned to and so on and so forth. Um, I've got a lean uh, but mean uh, working machine and we're we're ready to rev and uh, and to get this done. And um, convention is something that happens every year. That group is very well oiled and um um, I'm not worried about that. It's it's going to be the election that's going to be a busy time, and um, and then the governance. It's about putting the policies in place, and I've got some great folks um, on that. And so, yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. Awesome, John Mark. I want to thank you from both Ian and myself for joining us in the political trenches today. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks, Robert. Thank you very much for the time, and uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. I'm sure. 